Jesus of Nazareth, he has a, what would you say, significant place in UK culture and life. Jesus, he is respected, he is famous, and in general, I think you'd say that he has um, positive approval ratings. That's the sort of Donald Trump, Boris Johnson way of measuring, isn't it? But, um, but he is also a swear word or part of a joke and an irrelevance to most people. And there is as well, particularly in English culture, there is, there is something of um, poor Jesus, isn't there, um, in our kind of national understanding. Poor Jesus. He, he wasn't able to find a way through his, his difficulties. Poor Jesus. The way that nasty man Paul was allowed to rewrite his message and make it horrible. Poor Jesus. So he's sort of positive, but poor Jesus. But no one who actually met him at the time had anything like that view. Read Mark's Gospel. Um, we're only just opening the, the first page of it, but if you read right through it on, on Christianity Explored, the course that Ellie mentioned, or if you read it on your own, you would meet many varied opinions of Jesus, but none of them are kind of positive but regretful. They are either radically negative, they did execute him after all, or they are radically positive, or they are um, kind of confused before resolving into one of those two uh, places. And here tonight we are in Mark's introduction, and we're here to see the huge positive claim about Jesus. I want to show you that Mark's claims, they really couldn't be any bigger or any more important if they are true. We started last week by imagining that we were Mark's next door neighbor. So it's um, mid 60s AD, you probably live in Rome and Mark is your next door neighbor and he's giving us his new book, paragraph by paragraph, page by page, under the door. And tonight we're gonna look at chapter one, verses six to 13, which is where the story gets absolutely supernatural. Just look down at um, what Tor read and look down particularly at verses 6 to 13. Three times we're going to get mention of the Holy Spirit. Then there is a, a voice from heaven and then there is Satan. So it all gets totally supernatural. And you might ask, why, um, why doesn't Mark ease us in gently? Um, if he's trying to persuade us that Jesus is supernatural, why not um, start slowly with some wise teaching and then maybe some you know, coincidences and then get on to some full-on miracles later on? But actually, all the gospel writers do it this way around. From page one, they claim two things simultaneously. They say all of this happened in reality. Physical events in normal places seen by normal people. But then what happened, it was entirely exceptional, impossible, unless God really had become a human being. And Mark knows that his um, next door neighbor, you, is going to come asking for evidence, and the rest of the book is full of it. But I think there is something deliberate about putting spirit, a voice from heaven, and Satan all inside the first 13 verses. We are here to test whether the God who made you and owns you came on a visit to this planet 2,000 years ago. And if you ruled that out before we start, well, then there's no point reading on at all. If you're closed-minded to the idea that God came in person, well, then nothing Mark can say. So this is, is like a test of your open-mindedness. If God came to visit, well, of course Satan would be concerned. And of course, with an Old Testament open, the spirit would be involved and voices from heaven is the least that we would expect. So, having said all that, are you ready to listen to what the people who met Jesus say happened? And I want to show you three ways that Jesus is off the chart. First one is about power. Jesus is off the chart, powerful. Let me read you verse 7. Look down at verse 7. This was um, John's message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. 
Okay, I think you'll see that John is saying that Jesus is a lot more powerful than him. But what I want to do is just unpack that a bit until you can see quite how far we have broken the um, edges off the chart. So let's start with how powerful John is. Um, a lot of people are more powerful than me. Um, certainly you may have that too, a lot of people more powerful than you, um, more powerful than me, every politician, all the local councillors, every civil servant, police officer, traffic warden and park keeper, they are all more powerful than me. Um, so you think maybe John is like me, um, just not very powerful. So to help us, I've drawn a technical diagram. Can we have the technical diagram? There it is, um, very detailed. Um, designed to say John the Baptist is not like me. Um, we saw last week in verse 5 that John emptied entire cities. When he started baptizing 20 miles away, um, verse 5, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. He's huge, kind of celebrity stampede, huge. Uh, we also saw last week his arrival. It was predicted 700 years before by the prophets Isaiah and Malachi. He is God's herald and messenger. And we didn't really get much into verse 6, uh, which tells us what he wore and what he ate. Uh, all we said was that this is a uniform. It's the uniform of a prophet and of one prophet in particular. This is the uniform of Elijah, who um, I like to call Captain Prophet. As in, if the Old Testament was a sports team or a, a crime-fighting uh, group of superheroes, well then Elijah, he would be captain prophet. So those prophecies last week, they had told the Jewish people to expect Elijah to return before the end of the world. And now here is John dressed as Elijah. Jesus, later in his life, um, says, among those born of women so far, he means... There is no one greater than John. So there's our, our first gap. There's an enormous gap between um, a standard human and John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist says that Jesus is more powerful than him. But I have a second diagram. Are you ready for a second diagram? Uh, because we need to understand how much more powerful John means. So um, here it is. Um, the gap between the sandal owner and the sandal tie guy. Um, I don't know how used you are to um, having someone do up your shoelaces. Maybe that happened when you were pregnant or um, after you broke your arm. But for most of us, it is only in childhood and at the shoe shop. Okay? And when your mum does up your shoelaces, you, I guess, don't think uh, she's uh, less important than you. And I seriously hope you don't think the person in the shoe shop is less important than you. In my case, it means uh, I'm buying boots or trainers that are too cool for me and they simply don't think I'll cope without their help. But in John's day, well, in John's day, they went um, kind of open-toed through roads that were also sewers. And we're in a time when um, transport means horses, donkeys, and oxen. So if someone else put on your sandals, well, 99 out of 100 times, they are your slave. And, and actually not an important slave. I'm told that uh, even if you had Jewish slaves, you wouldn't use them to tie your sandals because that was simply too degrading. Okay, so look again at what John says in verse seven. Remember, he is captain prophet. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. So we're putting those two diagrams on top of each other and still some because even Captain Prophet is not worthy even to do slave work for Jesus. Jesus is off the chart powerful. Not that um, Jesus uses his power to, to boost himself. Um, I, I don't think Mark's neighbor probably understood all of verse eight, first time that he read it. You may have read it and not understood all of it, but you get a sense of it, don't you? Look at verse 8. John came baptizing with water. What was that all about, John? Well, it was about, verse 4, forgiveness of sins. People turned away from their sins, and John gave them a huge, big, symbolic washing, sploosh, and then said they were forgiven. Verse 8, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, you don't need much Old Testament background or much theology, do you, to get the outlines of that. Water, it washes on the outside, symbolically. But this next guy, he has access to the Holy Spirit. And he will baptize you, well, better, clearly, thoroughly, permanently, maybe, on the inside rather than the outside. And not just a a symbol, but a powerful, God-worked miracle on the inside. That is the work of the Spirit in the life of a Christian. So do you see how much Mark has claimed already? Jesus, he he is not here to offer religious advice or a, a pattern to live by. He is important enough that no chart could contain him and any human or religious figure you might want to put on the same page. And he is powerful enough to act inside your heart and your soul where you most need help. Don't you want that to be God's answer to the mess that we are in? Okay, that's point one. Point two, uh, Jesus off the charts credentials. This is verses nine to 11. Uh, John, he was a, a major celebrity witness in 33 AD. He was a big deal. But there is one bigger witness who Mark is able to call. So look down, verse nine. Jesus, he goes to the Jordan and he is baptized. And uh, Mark, um, rather than, there was actually a discussion at the time, but Mark, if we're going to read Mark, you need to get used to the fact Mark always cuts straight to the action. So uh, we go straight to verse 10. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. I, uh, I love that verse. I love that the, the verse. I love the sudden lapse into 80s estuary English, you know, not just pleased, but well pleased. Uh, I love that. But more than that, I love the drama. I love heaven to an open. And I love the truths that are contained in it. These three verses, they are rich in Old Testament background. Again, far too much for us to lay out in detail tonight. But up on the screen now are um, two key texts. If you want to write those down and read them later, Isaiah 42 and Psalm 2. In uh, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to turn to one of them. But before we do, just notice how far you can get without even turning them up, um, how far Mark's neighbor would get. Um, See where he's brought us. We had in verse 1, Mark says that Jesus is God. Then in verse 2 and verse 3, Malachi and Isaiah, they say that Jesus is God. Then John says he's God in verses six to, uh, 4 to 8. But now, God says he's God. There is the ultimate witness. This is my son. If the heavens are being torn open so that God can deliver that message, well then Jesus, he is off the charts. But the more um, Jewish knowledge and background you have, the bigger this is. Uh, We're not going to turn to Psalm 2, but Psalm 2 ties sonship to kingship. So this Jesus, he is God's ruler. In particular, this is God come in person to revive David's kingdom and rule perfectly over the whole world to the ends of the earth. But now um, I'd like to turn back to Isaiah 42. So keep a finger in Mark 1 and turn to page 728. 728. Excellent. So page 7 to 8, you should be in Isaiah chapter 41. And verse 1, here is the servant of God. And he is just as big a deal as a world king. End of verse 1, he will bring justice to the nations. Uh, Or look, middle of verse 6, he will be a covenant for the people of Israel and a light for the Gentiles. That is everybody else. And he is, verse 1, he is God's chosen one in whom I delight, well placed. 
God is delighted by Jesus, pleased with him. And how can you tell when this promised one gets here? Verse one again, I will put my spirit on him. So there is Jesus um, with the, the water of the River Jordan pouring off his shoulders. But far more important is the spirit coming down and anointing him, the spirit of God. Anoints him as God's son and as God's well-pleased servant. Which means we know all about him. So look at uh, chapter 42 and verse two. There's the character expectation, verse two, verse three. Do you see, it is not at all what we would expect of the most powerful man in world history. No shouting, no forcing people to do his bidding. In fact, verse three, you take two of the weakest most pathetic things that Isaiah can think of, the the bruised reed and the smoldering wick. Jesus is the sort of person who will not put them out of their misery. Instead, he will care for them and bring them back to life. That's who Jesus is. Which makes this a good time of year to be saying this, I think. It's the time of year when uh, new people arrive in London and new people come to church or come back to church. And it can be a time when people come to church uncertain. Uncertain of their place with Jesus. Uncertain of their place with other Christians. Does Jesus still want me? Uh, Is there still a place for me after the summer I've had or, or the lockdown I've had or whatever it is? Um, and Tor mentioned uh, what it's like being a student and arriving not knowing anyone. Um, I remember those two things together uh, when I arrived as a student in 1997. Uh, I'd had a, a summer of um, getting away from God. Uh, I arrived, I think, at university able to go in any direction at all. Could easily have been the moment when I gave up on Christian things. Just a bruised reed, just a smoldering wick, that's all that was left. Doesn't it make a difference knowing the character of Jesus? That when we come back to him, when we turn to him, most powerful man in history, uh, the servant of God sent to bring justice, who meets us like that. So you line Jesus up next to whoever you want, all of the available uh, competition. Try kings and presidents and generals and warlords. Well, he's the son. He's the ruler of the world. Or um, try messengers from God and prophets and gurus and spiritual guides. Well, he is the servant and he is the light to the Gentiles. See what John is doing in the verses before when he says, uh, this guy is that much better than me. John lines up Elijah and Abraham and Moses behind him and speaks on behalf of the richest Eastern spiritual tradition that ever existed, the Jewish faith and says, compared to us, we are not worthy when it comes to Jesus, which means you can certainly put any other religious figure or guide or prophet, the credentials of Jesus, they are off the charts, if true. Okay, third. Uh, Third, Jesus is off the chart victory. Verse 12, verse 13. So we're back in Mark. Sorry, yeah, thank you. You need to go back to Mark. Uh, Mark chapter one, I hope you did keep your finger there all the way through that. Um, If you had the king of the world and the light to the Gentiles, um, wouldn't you send him him off to get on with it? Uh, Go and do some ruling or some speaking or some enlightening. But look at verse 12. This is where the spirit sends Jesus as the first act of his public ministry at once. The Spirit sent him out into the wilderness where there are no people. And verse 13, he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Wouldn't um, Mark's neighbor, Mark's first reader, think that was a strange beginning to a book? Though again, I think he would work it out. I think he'd go away, he'd think about it. He might begin to work it out. He would get that this is a confrontation, wouldn't he? You have Jesus the the Lord God in human form, the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, the one who has come to powerfully wash people on the inside of all the consequences of sin. And first, he goes into the wilderness alone to meet Satan. 
It's a, a confrontation, isn't it? It's head to head, Jesus and Satan. And for 40 days, it says, Satan tempted him. It's a, a showdown. Even without any of the Old Testament background, you'd get that, wouldn't you? Even if you don't know that God's people were 40 years in the wilderness being tested and failing. Even if you don't know the Bible opens with a showdown between human beings and Satan and that they fail. Even if you know none of that, you see this is a fight. If Satan can get Jesus to sin, then Jesus is no good to anybody. And probably um, the expectations are not very high. Um, See, every single time that a human being has gone up against Satan, they fail. Um, Every single time, for endless ages, everywhere in the world, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how well-taught, human beings, they go out to compete and they fail. I I spent a year doing shift work for a charity in 1999, 2000, and um, one of my colleagues, he used the kind of flexibility that comes with shift working, uh, if you can swap your shift, he used it to watch his football team every single time they played. It was an exciting year for Ed, uh, because his team, they'd been promoted to the premiership for the first time in their history, after two other promotions in quick succession. Ed supported Watford, who finished that season with the record lowest points total in history. Um, Every week, uh, he would leave central London, hopeful, and uh, the personality Ed had, he would shout until he couldn't speak, and every week they would lose. And Ed would crawl back to work. Well, that is what it is like supporting human beings whenever we clash with Satan. Good intentions, high hopes, and defeat. But Jesus walks out into the wilderness and takes him on and wins. Um, You're going to have to trust me on that for two weeks. We won't really find out until verse 23. But um, the the angels and the wild animals in verse 13, that's Mark's hint that Jesus won. Which means Jesus is greater than all of us. He, He is off the chart greater. And greater at the thing that we find hardest. And most of us cannot live up to even our own reduced standards for even, I don't know, 10 minutes, five minutes. Jesus is better, better at not being a hypocrite, better at never being a fraud. Faced with temptation, we cannot help ourselves and we certainly can't help each other. So do you see Mark's claim, if this is true? Jesus' power And his credentials and his victory, they are off the chart. And and Mark knows that no one is going to accept this without evidence. And so the rest of the book is set up to deliver that page after page after page. And uh, we as a church, we're we're inviting you to come and read Mark with us, uh, with a group of others also asking questions. That is Christianity Explored, Monday the 18th of October and weeks afterwards. Um, But you may simply not be willing to wait Uh, You may just want to say to someone next to you, will you read Mark's gospel with me? Uh, Because notice finally just how Jesus wants to use his power. Um, Fourth point, so Jesus is hope and light for all people. And uh, this is just to draw together everything that we've been saying tonight. It's been there in every single section. Here is God's plan for sorting out the mess that we are in. He come in person, God in human form, and he will cleanse us from the inside out. He will rule as a perfect king, we need that, but with a gentleness that means no matter who you are or what you've done, you know that Jesus wants to put you back together. Uh, Jesus is the guy who bandages bruised reeds. It's like opening a hospital for blades of grass. That's who Jesus is. And he is the one who has defeated Satan and will one day put an end to all temptation and all failure and all evil. Doesn't that sound like what Isaiah says he is? Hope and light for all people. And the, um, the English cultural attitude to Jesus, poor Jesus, poor Jesus, 
It is so patronizing, isn't it? And no one who met Jesus was so kind of half and half about him. It's also inoculating. We know what that means now, don't we? And that view, it is the perfect vaccine to stop you from catching Christianity, give you a kind of weak, neutered form of it. Jesus is nice. Jesus is sad. Poor Jesus. Nothing to see here. And it is the perfect way to prevent Christians from bothering you about him. But the real Jesus, isn't he different? The real Jesus, when you see what he claimed and what the people who knew him, what they saw, we must, must speak about him. And you must listen, please, please listen to Jesus. I'm going to pray now that we do that. Our Father, thank you for sending Jesus as a light to the whole world. We ask our Father for um, those of us who know him that we would be utterly unashamed of his greatness, that he is beyond compare. And we pray for those of us tonight who don't know him yet. Father, please would you open our eyes and our hearts to see him as we read and hear those who met him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.